Yahweh, 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 
is for you. Yahweh is the lifting of my soul. It's unto you. Yes, it's unto you. I'm a winner. 
Bless his name. Living God. Glory to Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Good evening, everyone. Let's let's bless his name. Let's bless his name. Good evening to you, friend on Mixer Larry. God bless you. Let's just worship him and give him thanks for another opportunity to fellowship at his feet. Thank you, Jesus. It is by your get message that we are not consumed, and it is unto you that we are gathered tonight. We are grateful to you. Is Lord, is Lord, Amen. He has risen from the dead. Is Lord, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Can we sing his Lord? His Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. He has risen from the dead. Oh, every knee shall bow. One more time. Sing his Lord. His Lord. That's the highest truth. <laughs> Sing it with passion from your spirit. He has risen from the dead. His Lord. Every knee must bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul. Worship his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Worship you, Jesus, Lamb upon the throne. I am lifted up, sitting and throned above the circles of the earth, at the right hand of the majesty on high. Glory to God. Glory to Jesus. Thank you, Father. We are grateful to Jesus. Good evening to you. Such a joy to be here again to fellowship in Christ and share communion in the word. Uh, we've been away for some weeks now, but uh, the word of the Lord continues to spread through our various social media platforms. We're grateful to have you here online with me tonight. And we believe that the Lord will show himself faithful to us as we look into the mirror of the word i've missed you uh, and if you're joining for the first time this is kingdom network international and i'm here with some of the brethren for bible study the title of my 
exhortation to you this evening is the man, the message, the multitudes, and the medium. If you have your writing materials, it's quite important that you are able to take notes because what I want to share with you is very strategic in the scheme of things. You know, the reason why Jesus came was to actually restore man back to relationship with God. The reason why Jesus came was to restore us back, not just to relationship, but so that we can also function properly the way we were originally designed to function. All right, God created man for four cardinal reasons. We're created first for worship. Somebody say worship. All right, so we're created first for worship. And as a result of sin, the fall of the first Adam, who was our representative, you realize and observe that that relationship, that contact with our spirit man was altered by sin. And as a result of that, God, who is holy, must judge sin. And in his judgment for sin, there had to be a break in transmission, a break in relationship. And the heart of man, the conscience of man that was pure from the beginning was now corrupted, was now soiled. And so the relationship between man and God was severed. And God had to put an angel all right, at the very entrance of Eden so that man will not return to Eden to eat of the tree of life in rebellion and then live forever without God. You see that? So it was both God's justice and God's love that was finding expression in God sending man out of the garden. You see that now? But you see, uh, the title of this message goes beyond just some some uh, theological argument here and there. It is, it is what we must come to understand, especially in the last days. If you can see what God is doing in your time and in, in this season... You become like the sons of Issachar that have an understanding of the times and know what the children of Israel or God's covenant people ought to do per time. And the Bible says, and their brethren were at their command. So one of the ways by which the saints of God are going to manifest dominion is that it's not just that we are going to carry our Bibles, no, is that we will understand what the Bible says and how we are to engage in the world, even in this very time. Are we together now? So the title of this exhortation, this message to you is The Man. Please say with me, The Man. The, man. the, message, the message. The Multitude. The multitude. And, the and the Medium. Can we say it again? The Man. The, man. the Message. The, message. The, multitude, the Multitude. And The Medium. And One more time, please. The, the Man. man. Uh-huh. The, the Message. message. The multitude and the medium. So, you notice that if you look at that title, that caption, it is very deep. It is very wide. It's not something we can finish in 30 minutes. But for the sake of our Bible study, we're going to be cutting it bit by bit um, in series. The man. The man who... So, one of the things we need to first understand is who is the man? Alright? Then we look at what is the message? Why is there a need for a message having created man? So we want to understand what is man, all right? What is the message? Who are the multitudes? And what is the medium? Unfortunately, we have had a lot of people in church who have recited the sinner's prayer all right, who have even declared Jesus to be their personal Lord and Savior, but the kingdom of God is not that which is driving their lives. So the man gets saved, but he doesn't know that he is saved to actually become a minister, a messenger, all right, to convey a message. Are we together now? So when the man comes to understand the purpose of man and see where man has fallen short in the scheme of things before, before God and then how man can be restored, then he will not be able to capture the message and see why we all in Christ have been given the ministry of reconciliation. You see that? And then when man comes to understand his purpose for existence 
and then the message that God has given man to utter both to creation and then to unbelievers, then man will now be able to reach the multitude. But the problem really is not the multitude. The problem really is not the message because the message God has given us is the Great Commission. Somebody say the Great Commission. The message God has given us is an eternal gospel. The message God has given us is a message that answers every dilemma, every problem, every question that has ever passed through the human mind. Are we together? So the message is potent. The message is powerful. There is, there is no transformation until this particular message is heralded. There is no transformation. There is no impact. There is no change. There is no meaning. There is no hope for eternity. There is no life beyond the grave until the message, the message of the kingdom, the message of the gospel has been heralded. Not only that, this message must also be heralded, be preached by a particular medium. Somebody say medium. So if you are the man who is born again and a child of God in the last days and you have come to understand the message of the gospel, then the next thing to look for is how you will reach the multitude with what? The message. How you will reach who now? The multitude with the message. So that means that love, that means that our goal as children of God really is not to herald church doctrine. Our goal is not to erode, when I mean church doctrine, I'm saying our goal is not to erode denominational bias. You see that? Our goal is not to argue with other church members as to uh, petty doctrinal differences here and there. That's not the goal. The goal is that the church is actually the legal the, the legal base and the authorized entity for bringing this message to a people on an eternal, on a journey to an eternity without God. So we, we need to first understand what is man. All right. When we know what man is, then we can know how serious it is in the last days for every child of God to preach the gospel. You know, uh, was it said Augustine? That one said that preach the gospel and where necessary use words. But that is not really what the Bible says. The Bible says preach the gospel. How do you preach the gospel? By declaring it with what? The word of mouth. The word preach means to herald. It means to proclaim. It means to announce. All right. So evangelism from the world you are you angelion you angelistes is to around to preach a particular message. Listen, not every message is the message. Is somebody with me tonight? Are you with me tonight? Not every message is the message. A dying man does not need a tranquilizer. What he needs is what? What a dying man needs is a savior. You see that now? Imagine a, a man is about to die on his deathbed and you are giving him body massage. Will that save him? Huh? Body massage is not the answer to the problems of humanity. What man needs is more, a dying man needs is more than a body massage. He needs a solution. Is that true? He needs a cure. Is that true? He needs a remedy. Is that true? A man that is sinking in a swimming pool, what does he need? A lifeguard. Not he doesn't need somebody to start clapping for him, he doesn't need somebody to be advising him. What he needs at that time is somebody to bring him out of the pit. Now, this is where the trouble lies. Over 150,000 people die every day around the world. Now, that means that you can be rest assured that there are so many people going into eternity, but into an eternity without God on a daily basis. Are we together? <laughs> are we together? Yes. Now, why should people be living in this generation and you are telling me that they have not heard the gospel? Why should people still be alive in our own time? Jesus has risen from the dead. There is technology. There is everything. And yet, they died without hearing, believing, receiving, responding to the gospel. Listen, only the church has the cure to the problems of humanity. We have the answer. Somebody tell us that we have the answer. Yeah. It's not. 
Say we have the answer. We have the answer. We, see, if you keep the cure from a patient as a doctor, do you know that you deserve to be, I wanted to say deductored. <laughs> do you know that you deserve to lose your job? License your license will be, God bless you, your license will be withdrawn. You see that? Why? Because you have the answer and you watch a life, a soul, ebb away to an eternity, never to return anymore. Now, let us look at what is man for today. Let us look at what is man. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Let's begin from the book of the beginnings. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. Then God said, I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. You see that? Over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27. So, God created. Now, mark the word created. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Uh Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, we want to answer the question, what is man? The only way to be able to understand the essence of man, what man is, where man originates from, the purpose, the meaning of man is to look at the scriptures. Why is that? The scriptures point not to a, an antithetic evolution that man came from matter and that matter came from another advanced matter and so from a salamander to an ape and then from a, an ape to an advanced baboon and from advanced baboon to man all those theories of evolution are not really what the bible teaches what the bible teaches is theistic creation theistic means there is a god all right there is a sovereign being there is a a God who is behind the design of the entire creation and man being the apex of God's creation. Are we together now? So in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, the Bible says, And God said, Let us, that's the word Elohim barashamayim. Elohim means the Godhead, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit came together, the Trinity. And then they, uh, there was an agreement. There was unity of purpose. You see that? And unity of direction. And then they said, let us make man. Notice the word is make man in our image and after our likeness. Now, there is a difference between make and create. Are we together? There is a difference between to make and to create. To create is to call the things that be not as though they were, so that they can be. Let me put it this way. To create is to bring something out of nothing. To create is to bring the tangible out of intangible nothingness. But to make is to use existing material to form a thing, to form a product. Are we together? Remember when we were young, we used to make grasshopper houses and sand castles. We didn't create that. What did we do? We made it. What did we use? Existing material. So, man, now, you have to understand this. Man, the original essence, the original being of man 
is spirit and then encased in matter. Are we together? So, man is actually a creature of divinity. Man is a creature of God. Man was created in the image. Are we together? The word image is actually the word character. The word image, you know, when the Bible began to speak about Jesus in Hebrews chapter 1, he says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, he says, spake unto our fathers by the prophet. He said, in these last days, are spoken unto us by his son. Now, he now began to describe who the son is. Because in Genesis, you don't find the son. What you find there is the word. Are we together? So, he now said, he spoke to us by his son. He now began to describe who the son is. He said, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. So, the word image is the word character. C-H-A-R-A-K-T-E-E-R. The word character means the exact representation of the original. Not a photocopy, but what? The exact representation. That's why Jesus would come and then he would say, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So originally, when God created man, when you, should, when you look at Adam, who were you looking at? You were looking at the exact representation of who? Of Elohim. But remember that God is invisible. Is that true? But God is invisible, but he created man to be able to relate in the visible realm. Are we together? Although God cannot be seen, he created man in a way and a manner that man can relate with visible creatures and then creature can also respond to man. Are we, are, we, are we getting this? Now, so this is what that means. That means that man is both spirit, soul, and body. There is nothing like man is spirit and then soul and body is not man. Man is just spirit. No, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that when God made, remember, God made man in his image, right? You know what that means? That means that God has hand. You see that? God has eyes. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord run to have flow the earth. You see that? So God has hands. Are we together? The Bible says God has nostrils. He said, and God breathed into the his nostrils. You see that? The breath of life. It was a the release of the breath of life that made the life of man derived from God. So, God breathed into man. That means that when God breathed into man, the casing that was lying flat, that was lifeless before, that was without senses, right? That would not respond, that would not move, that did not have a will. Now, when God breathed, both the spirit component and the soul component was released into man. Is somebody getting what I'm talking about? So, this is what happened when God breathed into man, both the spirit, that component, that faculty that makes you to be able to respond to the realm of the spirit and to respond to God was there. Huh? And then the soul, the mind, the will to choose, either to respond to love or not to respond. You see that the free will was there. The intellect to think was there. Morality was their conscience. All of them came as a result of the breath of God into the nostrils of man. So God made man and then he also, God created and then he also made man. So re remember we are saying what is man and we have said that God, you know, did a lot of creation, um, act the creative activity for the first five days and then the sixth day remember that the first experience that the first adam the first man would have was actually rest so god created man to be last you see that and when god creates man to be last it's actually a sign that man is the apex of god's creation man is with the what the apex of god's creation that means that god who is the master has decided after working, all right, and creating, he now says that my masterpiece is going to be man. 
So, in man contains certain elements, certain faculties that animals do not have. Man is more than an higher animal. Uh -uh -uh. M man is more than an animal because God is not an animal. Animals live by instinct. You know, there, there was a book I read one time and I, I, I was almost discouraged, but again, you know, uh, we are all learning and growing. Man does not live by instinct. It is animal, the height of the relationship, the expression of the glory and the, uh, you're right, the glory of God in creation, when it comes to animals, is instinct. But in man, men don't live by instincts. Men live by free will. Men live by choices. We are responsible for our choices. You see that? Animals can, you see, there are animals cannot express love for God. Man is the only creature of God with a free will to choose either to love or to hate. You see that? Either to obey or to disobey. Man has a free will. Man, can, man has that capacity to receive love. Do you know that the highest need of mankind, what do we need the most? Is love. There are people who on their birthdays, they shed tears, and they've not shed tears in like 30 years. And then you ask them why. Sometimes they can't explain. Uh -uh. There is something in every man that will respond and be broken down at the face of genuine love. So that means that <laughs> even our morality is derived from God. Why? Because he put a conscience in us. So we are looking at what is man. So man is the image, the representation of God on the earth. Man is the is the apex of God's creation. Man is the representative of the will and the purpose of God on the earth. Man is the object of God's affection. That's why the psalmist said, what is man? Can we see Psalm 8 and verse 4? Psalm 8 and verse 4. If you look, Psalm 8 is actually, a, you know, that's the scripture that speaks about the glory of the Lord in creation. In Psalm 8, if you begin reading from verse 1, it says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, uh -huh, who have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, all right, or nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Verse 3 now says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your finger. So you see that creation is the work of what? The finger of God. The moon and the stars. That speaks about the constellation the galaxies, the planetary bodies. Are we together now? All right. The stars which you have ordained. He now says, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? You see that? What is man that you are what? Your mind is full of him. That means he has, he has captured, there, there is something you did to man that even you have put so much of yourself, invested so much of yourself in man that you cannot look away from man. Even when you choose to ignore man because you are self-existent, yet because you are also love, although God is self-existent, he doesn't need anybody to exist yet. God is also love. And because God is love, love must always find an object to shower his affection upon. And the only creature that can answer the question of this dilemma is man. So God decided after the six days, I said, I'm going to make man. Are we together now? So now he now says that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you visit. He says you have made him a little lower than the angels. And I taught you. You already know that the angels there is not uh, Michael and Gabriel. It is Elohim, the Godhead. Yet you have crowned him with glory and honor. And you have made him to have dominion over the work of your hands. And put all things, you know, under his feet. So you realize that man is actually the creature, a creature of God. That has the capacity 
to know God, to know himself, and to respond to the will of God from his spirit. Animals, that is why when animals die, they don't go to heaven. You say, ah, that dog was a good dog. That one went to heaven. That other dog is a bad dog. He, that dog went to hell because he died of rabies. No, that's why. The, 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 what You know when the Bible says the spirit of animals? What we are talking, the soul of animals, what the Bible is actually referring to is that when animals die, their spirit don't go to God and say, oh yeah, God, judge me. Remember in the book of Revelation, he said, I saw the, the dead, all right, both great and small, of men and women, children, not dogs and birds and say mouse oh yeah all of you line up the one that stole pastor larry's rice where where are you it, it, that did not happen you, you you get what i'm saying now when they die this is what happens when animals die their soul it vanishes just like a mist it's off but the but when the body dies for man the spirit it departs that's why when we cross over through the corridors of the great divide we are going to know ourselves you see that and that's why some people will cry in heaven we will still get to message maybe next week the reason why some people will cry in heaven is because they got to see they, are, they, are, they, they realize that their loved ones they didn't make it. Why? They didn't respond to the gospel. Or maybe they didn't even preach it to them. Are we together? But we are looking at what is man. Now, let's check another scripture. Job chapter 7, verse 17 to 18. We will just answer the question, what is man today? Trusting God. And then we will continue um, in the next session of our series. Job 7, verse 17 and 18 what is man that you should exalt him that you should set your heart on him <laughs> you know this this series is titled what the man right yes. the wow. message the multitude and the medium what we are looking at is see when you understand how god places man you will not realize any soul that that comes that you come across anymore you are not going to treat people as though they are just animals in time who will die and then their spirit will depart like a vapor. No, you will treat them as entities that are eternal. That what they do in time goes on to count for against them in eternity. Are we together now? Now, look at this. What is man that you should exalt him, that you should set your heart on him, that you should visit him how? Every morning and test him every moment. Now, 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 look, this is powerful. This is powerful because when you read the book of Genesis and the Bible began to introduce us to the Garden of Eden, one of the things the Bible said that is very key for our understanding this evening is that the Bible said that in the evening, in the cool of the day, are we together? The voice of God. God bless you. The voice of God, the Bible says the voice of God was walking in the midst of the garden. You know what that means? God came to pay man a visit. Do you know what that means? God was not actually living in Eden like God's boy quarter is in uh, uh, Peon or Pishon or Gion or Euphrates streets in Eden. No. God, remember that God is greater than creation. Right? He's sitting and thrown above the circles of the earth. So it's not as if God is living in one corner in Eden that man cannot approach the place. Uh -uh. God is living in the highest of heavens beyond Eden. But the Bible says in the cool of the day, God will come and what? And visit. You know what that means? Man was made for fellowship before activities. So we are created first for relationship before activities. And this is why I teach a lot. When I teach on purpose, I tell people that the first purpose of God for you is not uh, to be a banker. God said, I should be a banker. God, that's not the purpose. The purpose of God for you first is to know him and then by knowing him, now live as he wants you to live. That's the foundation for living on purpose. So if you have not come to know God and you are pursuing activities, if you will do it for 35 years or 100 years, you are still going to find out at the end of your journey that you were never fulfilled. Why? Because the goal was not to do things. The goal first was to know him. Are we together now? So we are looking at what is man. The title of the message again is the man, the message, the multitude, and the medium. So what is man? This is Job now, all right? And the scripture, you know, Job was saying that his own suffering is so comfortless, nobody can help him, and he began to ask all kinds of questions. But you see, we have just defined that man is a creature of God, right? Number two, man is the object of the affection of God. Do you know what that means? 
That means that even when a man is not born again and a man is not yet saved and a man is living like the devil, do you know that God's love is still looking for that man to bring him to himself? Are we together? Do you know one of the reasons why God doesn't really judge people immediately except maybe for some few occasions in scripture? Do you know why God doesn't? You just lie now and then, pew, you have died. Do you know why it doesn't really happen like that? Because God himself knows that man is an entity with a will. He can choose to turn away from sin and receive his life tomorrow morning. So God waits to the very end of our lives when we breathe our last before he decides to now judge us. Are we together? That's why the Bible speaks about the judgment throne. Huh? And the great white throne judgment and the mercy seat judgment. He says, what is man? The object of the affection. Somebody say, I'm loved by God. Loved by oh my God. Somebody say, I'm loved by God. My brother here is from Kogi State. He's the son of uh, Mrs. Mesheru, the precious woman of God that I, I think I wrote about her on Facebook very recently. My upcoming book is Glorious Presence. I wrote it in their house. Remember the last time I was around that I held like a three-day retreat in your house, the former house, right? You remember. So this is love. Let's welcome love. Love. God bless you. We're happy to see you. We're happy to have you around. He's a wonderful young man of God. So... You, his name is love, all right? So I guess while well, I'm just talking about love, I just can somebody say, I am loved by God? Love you have to, God. see, you have to. Do you know one of the reasons why people have inferiority complex? They don't understand what is man. When you know that you are loved by the creator of the universe, uh uh, and then somebody now speaks against you, and then you go and commit suicide. I remember I heard of a news some years ago, I don't know some of you, it was quite viral, of a university undergraduate who, because the boyfriend didn't buy her birthday gift or wish her Valentine, uh, buy her Valentine gift and jumped from the dormitory and committed suicide. You see, you see that? That's, that's, that's to show you that every man actually wants to feel loved. Every man is yearning, even though we don't say it, is yearning to be loved, is wanting, you know, that affection. But the only place you can really get true love, genuine love, that looks even beyond your shortcomings and still provides a way of escape for you is in Christ. Is somebody with me now? So, we are saying what is man. So, we have discussed certain, you know, dimensions, but let's make it a bit uh, systematic. Point number two will now be... All those points I gave you, just put them under number one. Point number two is man is a created being. Hmm. Now, now, this has a lot of implications. Man is a created being. Now, I've taught us that when you're coming for Bible study, you come with notebook, you come with a jotter, all right? You come with a diary. I guess these are first uh, meetings since COVID, gathering together like this. So, please um, remember to come with jotters. The things I'm teaching you um, are very powerful and very essential. All right, so man is a created being. Please open with me Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. If you have Bible on your phone, you can open it. Psalm 139, verse 14 to 16. Man is a created being. I was teaching just um, some minutes before you came in that um, there is a difference difference between created and made. How many of you remember the, 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 the Bible portion in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26? Remember the Bible says, and let us make man. Are we Bible students? Yes. And let us do what? Make. make. And yet he said male and female created. So I said that to create is to bring something out of nothing. And only God can do that. But to make is to use existing material to allow for that which is your thought, your intent, to become a tangible reality. You see that now? Now, here in Psalm 139, verse 14 to 16, see what the Bible says. I will praise you. Can we read together if you have your Bible? Psalm 139, verse 14 to 16. I will praise you. Are you there? Psalm 139, verse 14 to 16. Let's read one to read. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh -huh. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought 
in the lowest parts of the earth. Let's read verse 16 together. Very wonderful scripture. One to read, please. Your eyes saw my substance, uh huh, being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. So, do you see that that scripture actually tells us that one, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Two, marvelous are the works of God, and my soul agrees to this fact. And then he said, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. This is why abortion is a dangerous thing. God told the mother of Jacob and Esau, he said, what you have in your womb is not sperm. What you have in your womb is not... Uh, is, is not zygote or fetus. What you have in your womb are two nations. How can God call six months uh, or six weeks pregnancy and say those are nations? You know why? When God allows for you to begin to form in the womb of your mother, he has already prepared a future for you in himself. And so abortion is not just termination of earthly existence. It is a threat to the destiny that God has created every man to live in. So abortion is a threat to kingdom advancement. Imagine Moses was aborted. Imagine Jesus was aborted. So the salvation of the entire human race will be hanging in the balance because of abortion. Who knows, maybe some deliverers that ought to manifest in this season now, they were aborted some 25 years ago, some 30 years ago, some 18 years ago, some 12 years ago. What is man? Man is a created being. Please say with me, man. Man. Somebody's not saying, somebody's saying something there. Say, man is a created being. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 12. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 12. Thank you, Father. I have made the earth and created man on it. See, if you have your Bible, you have to underline that place so that you won't fail. I have made the earth and please pay attention, very essential. I have made the earth and created man on it. So let me ask a question. According to this scripture, Orimison, who made the earth? Favor, who created man? You see? So that means that God is both the maker and the creator. Do you see it here? Do you see the dichotomy here? That he made and then he still what? He created. So he said, I have made the earth and I have created man on it. He says, I, my hands stretched out the heavens and all their hosts I have commanded. So man is a created being. Now, because man is a created being, there are implications. That means that man cannot live for himself. Why? Man did not make himself. Are we together? <clears throat> man is not self-existent. Why? Because he didn't exist of his own will and his own accord. We exist because God wanted us to be. <clears throat> Are you following me? We exist because God allowed. That means if God did not will for us to exist, we cannot exist. Uh, did you did you catch, catch catch what I just said? So man is a what created being. Point number two. Now this leads us to point number two. Because man is a created being, please write it down. Because man is a created being, man is a dependent being. Every time any creature of God wants to live independent of God, it dies. Why? Because God is both the source of life and the sustainer of life. Whatever is the source of a thing has the ability to sustain the thing. That's why we call him Abba Father. Ab means source and provider. So when Lucifer decided that he was going to live contrary to the original counsel of God, what happened to him? He said, how are that falling? Oh, Lucifer, star of the morning. He said, you said in your heart that you will exalt yourself above the stars of God. You will be like the most high. And God saw that iniquity in you and then he cast you down. Why? Satan was not looking for interdependence. Satan was not looking for fellowship. Satan was looking for independence. So Satan wanted to be running his own show. 
Are, are you learning something tonight? Are we together? Yes. Are we together? Yes. Now, listen to this. We said, number one, that man is the object of God's affection and the height of God's creation, right? We said, number two, now, that man is a... Check your notes. Man is what? A... Is a created being. A created being. Very essential. Number three, we now said, man is a what? A dependent being. That means that we cannot... We cannot sustain ourselves. Why? Because even our spirit, when we depart, our spirit is still going to stand before the one that gave us the life itself to be judged. Somebody say with me, man. man. Somebody say with me, man. man. Is a dependent being. Dependent. Acts chapter 17, please. Acts chapter 17. Man is a dependent being. Acts chapter 17 Verse 23 to 31. Man is a dependent being. Acts 17, 23 to 21. I would read from here. For as I was passing out this Paul, you know, contending with um, uh, the philosophers at Athens and, you know, speaking about Areopagos and the unknown God that they were worshipping and didn't know. You know, they, they, they had a very funny mindset in their day that the more the gods the safer they were. That's why the Philistines carried God, the Ark of the Covenant, right? And put it in the temple of Dagon, the Philistine God, thinking that the more the idols, the safer. So they have God of fertility, they have God of uh, protection, they have God of um, productivity and agriculture, they have God of war, all right? They have God of <laughs> good weather, they have <laughs> all kinds of idols that they had. But look at this, in Acts chapter 17 from verse 23, for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you now, look at this, God who made the world Number two, and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. And he has made from one blood every nation of them to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined to be pre-appointed, sorry, determined via pre-appointed times and the boundaries of of their dwelling so you notice here he said number one that god is not worshipped with men's hands all right or in the does not dwell in temples that are made with hands and then he said he has made from one blood that one blood was adam you see that every nation that means that adam was our first representative that means we were all in his loins in prophecy, just like we were all in the loins of Christ when he hung on that cross. And then he said, in Christ, when he died, all you who believe, you died with him. When he was buried, you were buried with him. When he rose again from the dead, we were raised together with him. And now that he's seated at the right hand of the majesty on earth, we too are seated together with him. where in the heavenly places far above principalities and powers now here he's saying that listen you are actually created by god and your worship ought to be to this one true god so that they should seek the lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each of us he now says in verse 28 which emphasizes that man is a dependent being let's look at verse 28 for in him Notice he didn't say in earth. <laughs> he says in, in him we live, live uh -huh, and move, and, move uh -huh, and, have the, and have our being. The essence of our life can only be found in him. We live, we move, and have our being. Also, some of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are offspring of God, look at that, we are offspring of we spring from God. We are offspring of God. We ought not to think that divine nature is like gold or silver or something to be shaped by art or man's devising. So there is naturally the way God designed the, 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 the soul of man. Because there is a component of God in every man. What happens is that by default, man is a worshiper. Remember I said man is created. Number 
three. Now man is dependent by default. Man, you see the word anthro. There's something we call anthropology. Have you ever heard of that word before? Are, are you researchers? Have you ever heard of anthropology before? My goodness, you've never heard of anthrop- anthropology before. Oh, okay. Anthropology is actually the study of what? Anthropology is the study of man. Anthropology is the study of the existence of man. Theological anthropology is called the doctrine of man. The word anthrop- man is actually from the word anthropos. Anthropos in the ancient Greek actually means to stand upright, looking upward in order to gaze at something that is beyond your present existence in order to find meaning for your life. Anthropos. To stand upright and look upward. So that means that even in the design of man, we are designed to look where? Upward. Is somebody with me tonight? Is somebody learning something tonight? Job chapter 33 verse 4. As we begin to prepare to round up for tonight. Job 33 and verse 4. What is man? We are looking at the, the gravity of this subject. Because if you understand what man is, then many problems will be solved. Job chapter 33 and verse 4. Now listen to this. This was Elihu contradicting the doctrine that Job had been trying to purport. He said, the spirit of God has made me. I, I like this confession. I like this confession. Please say with me, the spirit of God. Spirit. No, somebody, somebody's never sure. Say the spirit of God. Spirit oh my God. God. Say, say it with conviction. Say the spirit of God spirit. has made me. And the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Now look up. Let's say it together. One to go. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. One more time, please. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. One more time. The Spirit of God has made me. You see that? And then the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So do you see that we actually owe our lives to who? To God. Why? The Spirit of God has made us, and His breath is that which powers our life. You know what that means? Even if you are not yet born again, guess what? You are living on borrowed life. That life is not your own. It's still God that gives you. <laughs> ah, may heaven not run at a loss over, over our existence. In the name of Jesus. Point number four man is an intelligent being. Number one is what? Created being and the object of God's affection. Number two. Number two is man is a created being. Number one is man is the object of God's affection and the highest of God's highest expression of God's creation. That's why I said, what is man? Are we together now? Number two is man is a created being. Number three is man is a dependent being. That's excellent. Number four, man is an intelligent being. Somebody say intelligent. intelligent. The way you are saying it is scaring me. Somebody say intelligent being. Intelligent. Now, what does it mean to be intelligent? When you say somebody is intelligent, what does it mean? You have a mind, right? That can think, right? That can calculate, right? That can organize. Are, are we together? That can know danger and spot it. An intelligent mind that can that's why you see human beings. How many dogs have you seen that they said that dog is an inventor? Why it was given to man to be a representative of God and then prefer solution to creation. It's not God that will come down from heaven. You know, we sing all kind of songs, and I don't I don't have it. I, I'm not fighting any song today. Today is not a day of song wars. Come down, no Lord, that manifest your power. It does not mean that. Well, I don't know how people mean it, but that does not mean God is going to come down from heaven. You see that? And they carry sword and say, I wonder for this area, they go agree. That's not what God is going to do. God is going to solve the problems of humanity by allowing his spirit to rest upon people like Daniels and Josephs and then they prefer solution to the problem. So the answer to the problems of humanity is actually going to come from God, but through men. You see that now? So we are talking about darkness and death. Thomas said this in shows up. 
Are we together now? You are talking about trying to fly, and then people look at the bumblebee and the flying insects and, and the birds and can pick from the creation of God, all right, a blueprint as to how to live a more comfortable life, and then they create the right brothers, create aeroplane. You see that now? Somebody looks and says, ah, we can reproduce our images, and then photography came up. Are we learning something? So it is man. Man is an intellectual being. This is why madness is a terrible thing. And this is why when Jesus saw mad people in the scriptures and blind people, he healed them. Madness is like a suspension of your soul. It, there, is, there is a problem. But guess what? Even at the height of madness, you will still see mad people when they want to cross the road. They will, they will check. You know what that means? Man is still an intelligent being. Even in, in, the, in the maddest of his madness, he can still say, eh, if I enter this thing, <laughs> so when you see mad people, they say, ah, he's watching to cross. Uh-uh. That doesn't mean he's not mad. He may be mad, but man is an intelligent, by design, every man is an intelligent being. Are we together? Genesis chapter 2, all right, verse 15, 19 to 20, as we prepare to wrap up. We'll trust God for grace to begin, um, I guess, earlier in our next session and then i'll pray that we all arrive early so that you don't keep us waiting genesis 2 15 and then 19 and 20 i'm going to read from here then the lord god took the man and put him in the garden of eden to do what to tend and what all right to tend and to keep it in verse 19 out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bed of the air and brought them to Adam to see. God didn't say, brought them to Adam and then hopefully. He said, to see what Adam will do, what he will call them. Huh? The Bible says, and whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. Now, you need to understand it. <laughs> it means that if God looked at um, the serpent and says, this is a, an elephant, you know, just using word play now, that, that is what it is. So God, even though he's the creator, gave man, right, that privilege. Why did he didn't tell dog to name cats? Or tell lions to name lizards. Uh-uh. He said, man is his chief representative on earth. So he says, Adam, here are all the animals. Name them. And the Bible says, whatever Adam called them was what they were. Because God also put, at that point, Adam had not yet sinned. So even his intellect was on another level. Because the spirit man too was not yet defiled. He was on another level. That was man before the fall. Are we learning something now? Man is an intelligent being. So in verse 20, the Bible says, And Adam, so Adam gave names to all cattle and to the birds, you see that, of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper or no comparable um, comparable to him. You see that? He didn't have an help meet, an help suitable for him. So man is an intelligent being. So when people say, I, I'm reading for example, for instance, ha, ha, and it's no entry, it's no entry, hey, this and that, uh-uh. By design, I mean, this is now without prayer yet, by design, man is an intelligent being. So when your brain is not assimilating, it's either you are breaking certain laws that should allow for your assimilation, you see that, maybe natural laws, practical laws, of eating well, all right, finding a space to study, getting quiet and not running around when you ought to study. See that engaging your mind and getting engrossed in that which you are trying to understand, that's a different thing. That's the natural practical laws. But there are spiritual laws where when you begin to read and you have struggled for days and weeks and nothing is, that, that means that there is an alteration in the original design that God made you even before the fall. Are we together? So mind by design is intelligent. That's why on campus, I never feel the course. I never feel the course by the grace of God. Because I, I on these things I'm telling you, I understood them for a long time. I know that I can How would I, how, 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 how would I represent God and fail? Now, I'm not saying that if people fail, it's bad. Um, that um, they can't pass again. They can't pass again. 
but you know there are different levels of testimonies you you can you can you can you can clear the records and set a new record as a child of god before the record was ah he's a pastor that's why he failed his course satan is attacking him how about he's a pastor that's why he passed the course because god is behind him is somebody listening to me are you listening to me i'm a child of god and then as you are preparing for your exams for instance you are preparing for yek is it yek or ijmb you are preparing for post jab and all that and then you are now saying oh god hey i don't know if i will pass you don't know if you will pass you don't know man is an intelligent being that's your answer you know why <laughs> because by design you should pass So feel yourself you, sh- you should be surprised you know they say I'm not surprised at failure no be surprised be surprised be very surprised he said you fail because hey I remember one time was it post 205 uh, political economy or so Dr Dilla did to one of our lecturers then back on campus in Nigeria University they pasted the course and then I had maybe 13 there for something and I was like wow no <laughs> you, you know there are some lecturers you don't go and meet and say you want to call for your script or something because if you are not sure of what you say have root to go and call for is double problem you are adding salt inside Injury. but I, I i knew what i wrote I, no and then i went there sorry i can't that 13 is not where are the exams and the, i didn't that's not my script sir. that's not my result we set for the result for two days we didn't find it in the office the third day when i came to set for the result my script was under his table the first layer under his table you know official tables that will have this uh, thing to cover my script was there and you know what he wrote there i think maybe exceptional or excellent that's what he wrote there He singled out my script among all the other scripts and he kept it. I think I later had was it 73 or so in political economy. I think we were just two years or so there. And I was the best. And that's the man you don't have any out like that but no. Why? An understanding. That listen, there is an intelligence there is a, an intelligence beyond cramming. Is an understanding, is a spiritual operation first, a revelation that dawns upon you that no, I can't fail. I'm the child of the king. I'm made in the image of God. Can God write an exam and fail it? I want to write I can. He, ah, who die? I can is the address. Who told you that? Was it no man that set the question? Is it no man that will read the question? Is it no man that will answer the question? Is it no man that will mark the question? Abba. Somebody tell yourself I can't fail. <laughs> so that means if you fail, it's just a, it was a mistake. And it shouldn't be happening every day. You'll be failing every day. Ah! It, failure cannot be your hobby now. If you, that's why Bible says, if righteous fall down seven times, let him get up again. Let him get up the eight. I can't sit down there and say, he's very... Man is an intelligent being. That, did you get that now? Yes. So as you are preparing for your exam, are you with me, guys? Are you guys with me now? Are you with me? Are you saying yes or you are just saying? Uh, yes. You are thinking about, oh God, we don't know. God for... Who eh? we'll say that again? <laughs> eh, well, uh, you know, this life says, God does know... Eh? If, if an angel slaps you from heaven, what will you... <laughs> okay. <laughs> That was just by the way. So, number one, man is what? The apex of God's creation. Number two, man is a created being. Number three, man is a dependent being. Number four, man is an intelligent being. Let me give you one more. We have to continue on what is man in our next meeting. Because I, I have many things to share. And I've just shared just four now. Are we number four now or number five? Number four now. Number four now. Huh? Okay, so what's number one? The, uh, the apex of God's creation. Uh-huh. Number two, created being. Uh-huh. Number three, dependent being. Number four, intelligent being. Number five, man is a moral being. We'll end with that tonight. Friends online, thank you so much for still staying with us. I'm seeing our friends on Mixer they online with us. Man is a moral being. Turn with me Genesis chapter 1 verse 29 and then we would see Genesis chapter 2 chapter 3. Let's see. Let's see Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 29. Is somebody there with me? Is somebody there with me? Now this was the command in Genesis 1:29. And God said, "See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food." Right? So that means that there was already an instruction. He said, and everything was very good. 
And then God now gave an instruction. If you look at chapter 3 and verse 2, he now said, although he has told you that you should eat of the things, all right, the fruit of the tree and all. He says in chapter 3 and, sorry, if you look at chapter 3 from verse 1, when the serpent came to meet the woman, the Bible actually tells us that the serpent asked the woman that did God say, now, in saying that, you find out that already there was an instruction by God that man should not eat of the tree of the garden. Are we together? Yes. Now, for you to understand that, we will now return to Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. Genesis 2, 16 says, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, all happens to you, you will die. Now, if you look at, you know, we're saying man is a moral being. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, this is powerful. Can we read together? Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. One, two, read. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Uh huh. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. In verse 9, something powerful happened. God now called to Adam. Guess what the question was? Where are you? Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Listen, what there are people that used to say that if, if God truly exists, we are, why is there evil in the world if God truly exists? Now, that question is already a mistaken question. Because for you to say that there is evil in the world, that means that you are also establishing that there is something called good. Because you can't say there is evil and not have the opposite, which is what? Good. Are you following my train of thought? Now, for you to say that there is good, that means you must also let us know that there is a moral law that you can use to mark as a marking scheme that this is good and this is wrong. If you are agreeing that if you are saying there is a moral law, then because all men over the ages don't live forever, we all die at some point. That means that there will be a moral lawgiver that spans from generation to generation. And the only one that fits into this category is God. Else, if there is no evil, then that means there is no good. If there is no good, that means there is no evil. So, what exactly will now be your question? Saying that if God exists, why is there evil? So, man, so in the design of God, one of the components of the soul is conscience. While it is true that as a result of the fall, the conscience is beginning to become numb over time, and then the Bible will say the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? You see that David will cry and say, In sin did my mother conceive me. You see that? So that the sin nature, before the sin nature came, man was pure in his conscience. He was responding to the will of God. He was living righteous. But when he sinned against God, his soul was darkened. Sin first came into the human race, not from Adam. He began first with the serpent. He began with Satan. Satan rebelled against God and, you know, he was cast down. And then Satan now tempted man to sin against God so that sin can now transfer also onto the entire human race. For in Adam, we all sinned. That's why Romans 3, 23 now says, All have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. But here is where we are now. Man is a moral being. That means that configured in every man, no matter how depraved you are, even if you are not born again, there is still something in your heart that guides you, like a moral compass, like an inner police, that when you do something wrong, even though you are not a Christian yet, you just know that that thing, you get, you, that's why you see some people smoking, and then they just see somebody else. Nobody preach to them. Nobody judge them. They just click keep the thing. Or they just look ashamed and who told them that what they are doing is wrong even though they do not have Jesus and they don't have the Holy Spirit? The conscience. Somebody say the conscience. the conscience. So the conscience is actually an inner police to prick the heart of man in order to be able to still seek 
to know God and then return back to fellowship with Him. Hmm. Are we together? So most times it is not, it's not that truth is not available in our generation. It's that many have chosen to suppress the truth and continue in their lawlessness. It's not as if people don't know that, oh, I think this thing is wrong, but they will not say it out. They will bring theories, they will bring arguments that this thing is right. But deep down on their inside, in the inner recesses of their soul, they know that there is something that is truly wrong with them. Sometimes some of them are looking for answers, but they don't find it. So they, they turn to drugs for the answers, for meaning. For confidence, they, they turn to they turn to weed, they turn to drinking. That ah, uh, when a man is frustrated and depressed, rather than sit down like that, no, to cover it up, to cover that empty life up, let me keep drinking, and then have that emotional high. But the trouble is that there is a level you get to where no matter the level of high, your body and the way you were designed, even if you are using narcotics or whatever, you are still going to desire more. You know why? The day you experience that high, that's actually the apex. But you keep seeking. That's how many people get addicted. They are seeking something higher than that high. But they will never reach that thing again. The only way to find that high is to actually be in a loving relationship with God and then with others. Are we together now? So man is a moral being. Somebody say with me, man is a moral being. Man is a moral being. You know, uh, while it is true that today there is a lot of lawlessness and people are saying um, abortion is legalized here, yeah? abortion is not legalized here, yeah? uh, this is legalized here, yeah? transgender, gay, bisexuality, homosexuality and all that. The, the truth of the matter is that um, every sane man that has a brain and is intelligent knows that there is a difference between entry and exit. Is that true? The Bible didn't say male and male created them. It said male and female. Man is a moral being. But, 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 but you see, another challenge actually is that... Okay, let me show you one more scripture. And then we we'll just pray for tonight. We would continue in our next meeting. John 7, 17. This is God trying to appeal, alright, to the free will of man. Trying to appeal to the moral conscience of man. In John 7, 17, Jesus said, If anyone wills to do his will. Because in the component of the soul, you have what? The will. Uh huh, the intellect, uh huh, the emotions, the imagination, and the memory, the will. God did not create robots or machines, He created people with free will. That means you can choose either to honor Him or not to honor Him. People say, But why did God not make sure that man didn't sin? Mm -mm. The way to test genuine obedience is to have the opportunity to disobey. The way to test whether you truly love me is to give you a chance to prove either your love or otherwise. So God didn't tempt man so that he would fall. That occasion was actually an opportunity for man to prove his love for God to the devil. That see, I love God more than the things you are presenting to me. And unfortunately every day, this temptation is befalling every man. It's facing us. It's now left to us either to give in or not. But let's let's tie it up with this concerning morality. I didn't know we'll stop our morality. I thought we'll do too much. But listen, when it comes to morality, you need to understand that the conscience of man cannot lead man to God. Even though the conscience is an inner police, in the book of Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2, you're going to realize that the Bible says that even though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, but they turned again away from him to their depraved and reprobate mind. The Bible says, and God left them to a repro- gave them over to a reprobate mind to do the things that are not pleasing, that are not convenient. That means they know the truth. They know that there is something, even though I don't know Jesus Christ yet, but there is something I know this thing is wrong, but they suppress the truth and they go on. And the Bible says, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. The reason why God gave them over to a reprobate mind is because when you say God is love, in the presence of love is the opportunity to choose. If somebody says he or she loves you and does not give you opportunity to choose, and when I mean opportunity to choose, actually opportunity and encouragement to choose what is right for you and help you for your destiny, that means that's not love. That's actually slavery or witchcraft. So God would not have been a good God if he created man to be the object of service but not love. 
That's why 1 John 4, 7 and 8, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. So, in the presence of love is the privilege of choice. Even though God is omniscient and he knows that this thing is going to destroy you, but because in the presence of love, you will have to choose either to commit to him, to be on his side, the battle of allegiance, or to, or to prove God wrong for loving you by going on the devil's side. So what the devil was looking for in the fall of man was not really to destroy man. It was to attack God. It was to grieve the heart of God. That the man that you say you so love and you are mindful of and you are visiting is actually a betrayer and a traitor. So what Satan was using man to do was to poke at God and say, you, you see that, look at the man you say you love, look at him. He will betray you again. That's what he did to Job. And then he says, it's not because you built an edge around him. It's not because you prospered him. You, let's take it away. And God said, okay, let's check him out. But don't touch his life. And the Bible says, Job's wife came one time and said, cause God and die. I mean, this, this pain is too much. Cause God and die. And Job said, do he slay me? I will praise him. And God said, this, this is it. The Bible says the end of Job was better than his beginning. How can God give you seven times more than what you had, including children that died? And you still live long enough to see them and their children. Ha! Ah! This God is mighty. But mo- your conscience... God should have used um, Job as Adam in the beginning. Oh, are you saying... Uh, okay. So are you saying you know more than God? No. no. Okay. Now this is it. The reason why God did not use Job as Adam was because God chose to use Adam as a representative of human race. Should I tell you the funny thing, uh, favor? Even if Job was actually the first Adam, don't be surprised that Job too might have sinned. Do you get? You know why? Because of this thing we are talking about, free will. It's like saying, it's like saying, why, why didn't God use Abel to die for the sacrifice, uh, to be the sacrifices of all men instead of Jesus? She be Abel was a righteous guy. <laughs> But in the wisdom of God, even the blood of Abel cannot bring redemption. Why? Because the blood of Abel was the blood of an innocent man. What God is looking for is not the blood of an innocent man. Animals too were innocent that they killed. Only the blood of God can appease the wrath of God. I'm going to teach that in our next class when I'm teaching on the love of God. Only the blood of God could appease the wrath of God. That's why when Abel died, the utterance that is blood was given. The Bible says God has Cain. He says, Abel, he said, Cain, he said, where's your brother? Cain said to God, am I my brother's keeper? And God said, ah, you don't understand. The voice of your brother's blood cried to me from the ground. Guess what? The voice of morality, the best of morality that Abel presented, even that blood was crying vengeance, not mercy. The best of men at that time, Abel, that brought sacrifice that God accepted, Yet his blood was saying, avenge me before God. He wasn't saying, forgive them. But when Jesus came, his blood, the Bible says, he speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. So God in his wisdom knows why. See, it, 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 Adam is not just a name. Adam simply means man. So whichever person's name you put on it actually would have um, fallen into that temptation. Because if Adam didn't chose, if Adam, Adam actually chose not to eat of the tree of, of the fruit of that tree, the question you ask is, why did Adam go and eat in that one and didn't eat of the tree of life first? And if he had eaten of the tree of life, there would be no need to even. But you see, that's why we are saying that. You see, the way which we are angry that Abba, why would you do that and put all of us in all this mess? Now all of us should not be suffering, and all of us just be. Eh? But sin has consequences. That's the lesson. That a man sin many years ago is affecting the entire marriage today. Abraham's birth of Ishmael is affecting marriage today, whether I like it or not. Are you learning something? But Christ's obedience is the, that's why I said the man, the message. That's what will lead us to the message. That the best of men in terms of morality. Before God, that righteousness, that right living, that right standard is like a filthy rag. 
That's what the prophet called it. He said, Our righteousness is like what? If you not righteousness of Christ, not righteousness of the believer in Christ, but the righteousness of every man who seeks to please God by following the works of the law and not by faith towards God. So the scripture says, Whatever is not of faith is sin. Are you seeing the logic now? That listen, man is an eternal being. Whether you now spend eternity with God or without God, that's why the message must come to you in the clearest form. And then you now choose. That's why we now take us to the medium. How do you spread the message? Have you first understood the message? Because you cannot spread the message accurately if you don't understand the message. And what is your role in spreading the message? Must you start your own church to spread the message? Do you need a ministry logo and a brand to, to spread the message? What exactly do you need to spread the message? The only endorsement that you need to preach the gospel and to spread the message of Christ is that one, you have trusted in Christ. True. Two, you have confessed him as your Lord and Savior. Three, you are willing wherever you are to start fulfilling the Great Commission in the best way you know possible. Four, you are willing to preach the gospel either through word of mouth or using your tools and your gadgets or representing other ministries or hosting live stream for other ministries or whoever is getting the gospel right around you. If you cannot preach it yet, eh, you find a way to make sure that it is still reaching others. Or else, people will go to an eternity without God but be full of morality but they are separated from God. Listen, there will be a lot of people in hell and the only reason they didn't make it to heaven is not because they stole from their neighbor or they killed anybody the reason why they will be in hell is because they were moralists they were not christians they were moralists they were nice they were people say ah if this i wish this person was a christian that's why you hear people say this person ah, i wish he was a christian this person is behaving better than a christian but listen you may be looking as if he's behaving better than a christian it is pride to not humble ourselves and receive the love of god in jesus christ you know what you are doing to god by doing that you are telling god that it's not wise enough to send jesus to die for the sins of entire humanity let's pray we're going to ask god for mercy tonight I'm going to ask God for mercy tonight. You know, we stop that man is a moral being because our morality, friends listening, our morality cannot take us to heaven. Christianity is not morality, but Christianity is not immorality. Our good works have a place, but they have to be founded first on faith toward God. It is our salvation that bears good works. It is not good works that bears our salvation. I want us to bow our head. Two things we are going to do tonight. Can we thank God? And say, Father, we are truly grateful to you for making me, <laughs> for creating me, for allowing me to find my existence, for bringing me into this world. Thank you for allowing me, allowing me into this world. Among many sperm cells, God allowed for you to be here. Can we bless his name? Can we bless his name? Can we say thank you, Father? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I am somebody in Christ. I, I, I am an entity to be reckoned with because of my, of my trust in you. Thank you for making me. Thank you. I acknowledge you as my maker. I acknowledge you as my source. I can somebody pray and say, I acknowledge you as my sustainer. Thank you. Thank you for the gift of life. Can somebody thank him for the gift of life? Can you thank him for the gift of salvation? Can you thank him for the gift of life? Can you thank him for the gift of salvation? Bless his name. Oh, glory to God. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We give you praise. We give you praise. What is man? What is man? What is man that you are mindful of him? What am I that you are mindful of? He didn't even say, who, are, who is man? He said, what? You see, this object of God's affection. He said, no, the son of man that you visit him. Lord, we thank you. We are grateful. You came from heaven to earth. To show us the way to lay down your life, you left the majesty of heaven to come and die. Thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for making me a dependent being, depending on you. Thank you for making me an intelligent being, able to think and provide solution to problems. Thank you for making me a moral being, that there is still free will and conscience in my heart. I thank you. I thank you. Oh, thank you, Father. You Thank you, Father. Can we sing with him? Thank you, Father. Oh, crucified, laid behind the stone, you leave, you leave to die, rejected and alone, 
like a rose, hey, troubled on the ground. You took the form and thought of me, thought of me. Yes, you were crucified, crucified. You were laid behind the stone. You lived, you lived to die, rejected. rejected the oh, troubled on the ground. Oh, that you took the fall. Can you sing it one more time? On the depth of your heart, you understand. Crucified, yes, you were crucified. Lay behind the stone. You live to die. To die. Rejected and the low. Like a rose. Trampled on the ground. Shook the fall. Thank you, Father. God of me. God of me. Wow. Second prayer now. Can we ask the Lord for grace this season? To not just live with morality, but Lord God to be expressions of God's holiness. Can we say, Father, we receive grace to be expressions. Can we pray, please? Receive grace to be expressions of your holiness. <laughs> Your nature, your character, your attributes, your eternal counsel. Can we receive grace? Can we receive grace? Gadahandra Tabahandros. Reketele Bendo Kabosa Kidabash. We receive grace. We receive grace to be expressions. Expressions. Beacons of light in a dark world. Shining as light in a dark place. We ask and we receive grace. We receive grace to walk in holiness and in newness of life. To be manifestors of your light in the dark world. To be salt in the earth. To be light. Metula hambra katala brati. It may look like I'm so rounded, but I'm so rounded by you. It may look like I'm so Let's pray for the quadrants of the gospel. So Say, Lord God, in this season, the, the gospel prospers through us as a ministry. Can we declare the name of Jesus? The gospel prospers. Kingdom Network International. The gospel reaches the nations in the name of Jesus through us in this season. Canada and beyond, Botswana, China, South Africa. Switzerland and other parts of the world that follow us already. We declare that our tentacles expand and spread. The gospel spreads through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let rise. Hey. Darkness <laughs> trembles in your holy Jesus through us. Spread your light, Jesus, the light of your glorious gospel through us. Can you tell Jesus, spread your light through me. Spread your light through me. Spread your light through me. Spread the light of your gospel through me. Let the message spread through me. <laughs> let the message spread through me because I am God's media. Let, let the message, let me become the medium, the, the window, the vista, the vista through which the message of the kingdom spreads in the name of Jesus. Spread your light. Spread your light. Thank you, Father. Spread your light. Thank you, Father. Spread your light. Thank you, Father. You. Thank you, Father. Let's declare over Nigeria. Arise, shine. Your light is come. And the glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Arise, shine your light. Arise, shine your light is come. And the glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord. Can we, can we lift our voice, please? Hey, arise, shine your light. Hey, shine your light. This is prophecy. And the glory of the Lord, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Somebody, two more times, say, hey. 
shine your light is gone The glory of the Lord is risen upon you Arise, shine your light. Arise, shine your light is gone. And the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Glory to Jesus. Let's just take a minute to pray for our brother, brother Toby, the HOD music of this ministry. Tomorrow is his birthday. Can we just declare the light of God shines through him brighter in this season? He sings the gospel, he preaches the gospel, he ministers to lives across regions and territories. Destinies are transformed because of his heeding the call of God. You bet new songs, you bet songs from Zion, you hear the whispers of the Spirit, you read the handwriting on the wall, you discern the voice of God, you discern the will of God, you align to the purposes of God, you align to the government of the King. In the name of Jesus, you spread, you thrive, you are like a watered garden. The glory of the Lord shines over you. He shines upon you. He beams upon you. The Lord causes His face to shine upon you. Multiplies your impact and multiplies your greatness on every side. Gives you peace and joy. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Blessed be your name. Thank you for your son, O God. We bless you. We are thankful for His life. Thank you for the impact so far and what will yet do. We give you praise and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's pray for all our students and our friends who are writing one exam or the other from ICANN, professional exams, um, JAM, post and all that. Can we pray for them and say in the name of Jesus, we decree and declare that they have an excellent spirit. You succeed, you triumph, you prevail, you excel, you come out with flying colors. Can we just declare in one word? By faith, somebody declares in the name, declare, of, the name Jesus. of Jesus, you, you excel, you excel, you excel, you excel. You have an excellent spirit in the name of Jesus. You thrive, you shine. You return with your testimony. Glory be to God in the highest. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Father, we thank you for tonight. We give you praise for the man, the message, the multitude, and the medium. Thank you for the beginning of this series. Lord, we receive grace and utterance. We receive wisdom, and we ask that lives will be truly transformed in this season through your work. And we thank you for KNI Studios that is in process. We thank you for the help that you have sent so far, Lord. We are grateful. And we receive more, we receive more, we receive more to accomplish your purpose and serve the gospel to your people across the nations with excellence. Amen. To the praise and the glory of your holy name. Amen. And the people of God say, Mighty. Amen. And the people of God say, A mighty. Amen. And the people of God say, A mighty. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Let's rejoice and celebrate Jesus. Glory to God in the highest. Amen.